Welcome back to another episode of Costume Cinematographico. In this episode, I look at the costumes from the hit series, Rain. In the comments section, I've had many requests for the CW show, Rain. I haven't actually watched the show as it's not my usual type of show that I watch. And it's not that I don't love CW type shows. I actually am a huge fan of both Supernatural and The 100. So just in case some of you are huge fans of the show, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the aesthetics of the costumes and I'm not actually going to take into consideration any of the character arcs or um, other influences that might be there. So I'm just going to fess up, this video took me a lot longer than I would usually take because I couldn't follow my usual structure, which I usually have for pretty much all of my videos. And partly it's because uh, this particular show is a little bit different than anything else I've done before. In a way, it's kind of a metaphor for the show because uh, the particular designer, she hasn't followed any one particular structure. and. I also was a little bit worried that I might offend some of the fans of the show. So I just want to say up front that anything I'm going to say in this upcoming video, it's totally just my opinion and you can just take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I'm not setting out to offend anybody, just so you know. So the series Rain, it's a highly fictionalized American television series and it's very loosely based upon the early life of Mary Queen of Scots, whose reign over Scotland began when she was just six months old. The series was started by Stephanie Sengupta and Laurie McCarthy. They created and developed the series for The CW, and that's an American network that targets young audiences. This show is currently in its fourth and final season. The show stars Australian actor Adelaide Kane as Mary, Queen of Scots, and English actor Toby Regbo, who portrays Francis II of France. Here's a sketch of a very young Mary, Queen of Scots at the age of 12 or 13, and a young Francis II, and both are by French Renaissance painter Françoise Clouet. In reality, Mary and Francis grew up together as children in France, and they had both of them had a great affection for one another. Both actors are in their early 20s at the time of the shooting, but were aged up in their roles as Mary and Francis, and that's a common practice that we see in Hollywood, including in Game of Thrones. In reality, the real Mary and Francis II were ages 16 and 15, respectfully, upon the crowning of Francis, as seen on the right in this royal portrait of the teens in 1559. You can see the modest dress and hair fashions of the time worn by Mary Queen of Scots. On the left is a royal portrait of Mary at age 16 by Françoise Clouet, and on the right is an early 17th century painting by an unknown artist from the Blair's Museum. The series Rain is actually shot in my hometown of Toronto, Canada, and we're sometimes known as Hollywood North. And you'll find a lot of shows are actually shot here, partly because we have such a low Canadian dollar uh, compared to the US Greenback, as well, our, uh, they use a lot of our local crews and talents. And I've mentioned before, other shows like Pacific Rim, Suicide Squad, and The Expanse have also been shot in my hometown. The series Rain is a largely anachronistic show. It's kind of a contemporary historical hybrid. Many of the main characters' costumes or clothing was actually purchased from just everyday stores. And uh, while the Renaissance costumes come from many of the costume houses throughout uh, North America and Europe, um, we find that a lot of the background players and the male characters are dressed from these historical uh, recreations. The custom garments are made by a wardrobe team of about 24 in the city of Toronto with 10 additional dailies helping with sewing and breakdown. And at the time, like in first, the first season, I don't know exactly what the percentage of costumes that were made. It was pretty low. Towards season four though, uh, I would say probably the majority of the costumes were custom made. So some people have compared Rain to the Showtime series The Tudors, which is sort of a sexy historical type romance. Uh, but it does, and even though it's anachronistic, it does have some of the story anchored more or less in history, while still taking many artistic liberties. Rain, however, is more of a harlequin, historical, romantic type romance um, that doesn't really have much resemblance to real life history. The series has quite a small budget, so 
Compared to something like HBO's Westworld and Game of Thrones, which have huge budgets, last season, Game of Thrones, for instance, had a 10 million per episode budget. Something like the CW Supernatural has a budget at a fifth the size at only two to 2 point million per episode. So I'm assuming that Rain has something similar. And each of their episodes is 42 minutes. Each season, like at least season one and two, had to produce 22 episodes. So that's like an enormous amount of episodes. And they shoot each episode uh, eight days at a time. So it doesn't really leave a lot of time for thoughtful concepts and design. Uh, really, they just have to get clothes on bodies and, and make it work. Also, the CW, they know their audience. So they approached this young costume designer named Meredith Mark with Pollock. She had actually worked on this series, Heart of Dixie and Gossip Girl. And so she knows young girls. She knows what the kinds of fashions that they like. And so she brought in sort of this contemporary, youthful sort of look to the show that would attract young audiences and young viewers. Mark with Pollock stated in an interview, from the beginning, the creators, the director, and the studio said they wanted to incorporate a contemporary feel in the costumes. The vision was there even before I signed on. I just helped execute it. She goes on to say, they didn't want the men in pumpkin shorts because it's not sexy. So we decided to give all the men custom leather pants. We made probably close to a thousand pairs. So to just show you what pumpkin pants are in these two images, you'll see Francis II and Lord Darnley in these two 19th century paintings by British painter Richard Burchett. Both men are wearing pumpkin pants, uh, the proper term is trunk hose, with their doublets or jackets. So you can see what she's saying here about them not being that attractive. Mark with Pollock says, for the women, it's finding that fine line of gown. I wanted gowns that kept some kind of Elizabethan element, whether it was a nipped waist and an extreme silhouette, or if it had a bit of a medieval feel. A lot of it was about keeping the textures in the palettes. I found a lot of off-the-rack pieces that felt bohemian and relaxed or super structured. So Mark with Pollock said women would put hip bumps or hip rolls over their petticoat and then put their skirt on and then their overskirt on to exaggerate the hips and make the waist look smaller. These Tudor underpinnings like the bum roll and Spanish farthingale, a conical hip skirt, they supported the overskirts and created the bell shape. Catherine of Aragon, the first wife of Henry VIII, introduced the Spanish farthingale to the English royal court around 1501. The French court actually introduced the wheel farthingale, which was a little bit more of an extreme silhouette. In these two pictures here, you're going to see a reproduction of a wheel farthingale and a corset, or stays as it's sometimes called, and this is a reproduction by costume technician Danielle Jordan. The farthingale, which is that rigid structure there, is actually supported by the bum roll. And Henry VIII's uh, youngest daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, she popularized that look and actually took it to extreme measures. And so just for fun, I found this amazing reproduction of an Elizabethan gown that's completely made of paper, so I wanted to show it to you. Uh, it's done by Belgian artist Isabelle du Borchgrave and it's made completely of paper and she's actually hand rendered or hand painted all these beautiful details on the skirt on the right. When Mark with Pollock describes the type of show that Rain is, she says, it's almost like fantasy instead of historical because you're coming up with a whole new look and it needs to be believable and something different for the viewers. I'm sharing with you here an image of the costume designer's mood board and from this picture, she actually took a lot of her own inspiration. So Mark with Pollock, she attempted to costume the show in a little bit of a guerrilla style technique. She started by combing some of the larger costume houses even before production began. She went to Angels in London, Torelli in Italy, and the Straf Stratford Festival Costume Warehouse in Canada. And if you're not familiar with Stratford, it's actually one of the largest Shakespeare festivals in North America. Uh, Ontario draws a lot of people from the United States and all over the world for it. And what happens is they have this large surplus of costumes that they store in an enormous warehouse and then they rent out to theater companies and film companies. So Mark with Pollock says, when you start a show, you're using rentals mostly. We were renting from Europe, from the studios in Los Angeles, 
using a ton of vintage and off the rack and really only building for our principal characters. Mark with Pollock also shopped ready to wear online from her office in Toronto saying, we shop quite a bit of vintage here in Toronto, but I'm also constantly scouring the web. Net-a-Porter, the Outnet and BHLDN are my go-tos. So it's obvious that many of the designer gowns are stunning and it's understandable that young people would love the costumes, especially because the young cast is so gorgeous and honestly, you could put them in a potato sack and they would still look good. And yet Rain has received quite a bit of criticism in terms of the design and the fact that it isn't, well, not just even the design, but the show itself is not historical. Uh, and yet Mark with Pollock, she knows her audience. She knows that it's attracting young viewers, young female viewers. And I've said this before, I don't think a design necessarily needs to be historically accurate to be good design. Uh, given that though, Mark with Pollock in this case, I would suggest is probably more of a stylist than a designer. What she's doing is she's going around collecting uh, an array of contemporary outfits. Now she might get them on consignment or in exchange for a credit. Sometimes they would buy them outright. Um, and then she's sort of assembling everything all together. As well, she might even get approached by certain designers who want their clothes featured on the show. I know that she had access to some of the jewelry designers, the crowns, shoe designers, and, and the like, who wanted their items to be featured, and, uh, and that's what she did for them. So what she then does is she takes all of these elements. She takes the dresses, the shoes, the handbags, the jewelry, and so on, and she puts it all together, and she attempts to create a cohesive look. Okay, so before we go on criticizing this show, I think we should all remember that it wasn't so long ago when historical accuracy wasn't even a thing in television, especially with costumes. So to my knowledge, I'm kind of going back a little bit of a ways, the very first historically accurate costume depiction was in the BBC's 1971 six-part miniseries Elizabeth R. that starred Glenda Jackson as Elizabeth I. The costume designer was Elizabeth Waller, who won an Emmy for her work on the show, and she recreated many of the historical Elizabeth's gowns for, for Glenda Jackson by adapting them from a number of the Queen's famous official portraits. The entire BBC wardrobe, and that's about a million items, were purchased in 2008 by Angels and Bourbons in London, who now rent out the costumes to shows like The Tudors and Rain. To give you an idea about the historical accuracy, here's one example of a costume reproduction based upon the Phoenix oil on panel portrait of Elizabeth I by Nicholas Hilliard. Uh, that's on the left. And then the reproduction of the costume from the BBC drama Elizabeth R is on the right. In this close up, you can see that the wardrobe team recreated every last little detail. I'm heading into some murky territory here, but I just want to mention that I feel that the producers have dumbed down the show for the audience, um, despite the fact that the audience is young and are female, many might be in high school. I think that that is actually unfortunate because I think they're not giving the audience enough credit. And there's two YouTubers named Kate and Britt who did a recent costume commentary about Rain, and they basically said that. And sadly, uh, they had some haters, uh, which was unfortunate, and because they were just sort of giving their opinion like I am. Um, but what they said is that they thought that the producers should have given their audience more credit, and in that, uh, they didn't feel that they did. So these girls, they, unlike me, happen to be the target age of the show. They actually, one of the girls watches the show and she did think some of the costumes were pretty and everything but she thought that they could have done a better job of that so um I found something similar to this a, long, a little while back with the CW's The 100 which I first started watching and I was a little unsure about it I love the premise because I love science fiction but I just found that they were doing a lot of love triangles with the teens and meanwhile there were all these really serious issues going on and it just sort of seemed it didn't really seem to make sense to me that they would be doing these love triangles considering that the stakes were so great but then I noticed in season two that they did actually change which I thought was amazing and they got rid of a lot of the fluffier storylines and then they went really more with the 
and anchored it more with these more serious storylines. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like Rain has done that because they're in their final season. But anyway, just putting that out there. So I don't want to be completely unfair to the young fans who clearly adore this series. Um, it's just that Rain, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, falls short in many aspects of design. And I'm not going to blame Meredith Mark with Paula completely because obviously it's not completely her fault. She was hired to do a job and she's doing it. It's really the producers who are ultimately responsible for the look and feel of the show. Part of what it is, in my opinion, is that each principal cast member wears something like three outfits per episode. This is what um, Mark with Pollock has stated. So if you look at the entire four seasons, that's like 234 outfits per character for those four years. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's way too many costumes. Like in Game of Thrones, which, you know, only runs like 10 episodes a season, the characters might have two or three outfits. And I realized that, you know, the quality of the costumes are way up there. But they could have really have knocked it down recycled some of the costumes a little bit more rather than just mass producing. That's what it sort of feels like. It's mass produced. So one of the suggestions I would have had in terms of tackling this design, first off, is I would have just cut the number of outfits and worked more on the design. So what I think might have happened here is if we had been given a more experienced costume designer who knows the limitations of the job, like, you know, not suffering burnout and having your team burnt out, uh, would it be able to, you know, tell the producers this is really more what I think would be a better thing to do? And also it would have pulled the whole show together uh, in terms of the look, made a more co cohesive look. Um, so there's three examples I wanted to give you here of contemporized historical stories for younger audiences that I think it did a much better job of this. So for instance, Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette that starred uh, Kirsten Dunst. Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, which is actually sort of a very a modernized version, but it still has some elements of, uh, of the Tudor period. And Brian Hedgeland's, so, sorry, Hedgeland's A Knight's Tale, which is extremely anachronistic, but it's very well done. It's a very well done version of that. So let me explain why I think those other three movies do a better job of it, because costume design has to be anchored in something. It can either be through a silhouette, which is essentially the outline of a costume form from a specific period of history. It can be done through a palette of color, through textures, or through patterns, and other ways. Okay, so I'm going to give you some good uses of design here. And I mean, this, again, this is my opinion. So the first one is Jean-Paul Gaultier did this fabulous, he's a haute couture designer, in case you don't know. He uses color in, in a way, uh, in The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover, that that really sort of sets the tone for the, for the movie. I mean, clearly she's working closely with the production designer, as is Cecil Beaton, who is also a costume designer for My Fair Lady, who did this fantastic black and white ascot tableau scene for that famous movie. And it's actually, it's been recreated over and over again because it's so amazing. Um, and then finally, Wes Anderson's Grand Budapest Hotel. So that last one, again, I mean, the production designer and the costume designer have clearly worked together. I mean, I can imagine this sort of being in Wes Anderson's head, you know, these individuals in an elevator. He's got this dark contrast between the red of the elevator and the purple of the, of the costumes with punches of red just in the piping and along the... Uh, the ribbing on the uh, the pants. It's just it's just an excellent use of color. Here's an example of how a costume designer uses a repeat of silhouettes, especially in groups of three, from this ball scene in Carlo Collai's 2013 film production of Romeo and Juliet, and it's got a really young, hot cast. Um, you know, they even though it's it's sort of in the traditional. Tudor Renaissance sort of feeling. He has added a bit of a magical quality to it. Uh, they used a lot of Swarovski crystals and they did these really sort of almost avant-garde style masks, Venetian masks. They're not, they're less traditional looking than you would typically see. And um, the other thing that he does is he uses a lot of repetition uh, as well as sort of the palette is sort of in a pastel. So it's all sort of very much anchored 
even though it's it's got that contemporary bit of feel to it. Here's an example actually from Rain that I is a good example of the design. We've got the three girls, the three handmaids, who are all dressed in, in slightly different outfits, but the color is the same. They've got this beautiful sort of dove gray color that really works well. So just as a suggestion uh, to have a more effective design, here are some recommendations that I would make and I'm, that I'm gonna go over. So what I would have suggested for Rain that they could have done is they could have had every character dress in a contemporary fashion, like just completely modernize the whole thing. They've done this a lot with Romeo and Juliet. Uh, it's been done over and over again. Uh, even if you go to Stratford, Stratford Festival to see a Shakespearean play, oftentimes they are modernized and it works really well if it's done correctly. The other thing is they could have dressed everyone historically, but just had a few modern touches. And this is sort of what they did in the Tudors. I mean, they tried to stay mostly historical, but then they'd have these little odd anachronistic touches to it. The next thing they could have done is dress the characters anachronistically, but kept it to only one period. So that, like say they would have set it in the 40s. Everyone would have been dressed in the 40s. Kind of like how Blade Runner is done. Uh, this image here actually I think is a really good example of sticking to one period and she, the designer uses soft palettes and repeated textures you can see in the cloak and the brocades that the, she's got those repeated textures. The silhouettes are very very similar and the palettes very similar and it's interesting that this is such a good example because it actually comes from the episode Clans for which Mark with Pollock won a Canadian Screen Actors, sorry Screen Award for Best Costume. Okay, so I'm sort of making a collage here of all of the different looks from the show, and this is sort of what drives me a little bit batty. Um, really, the designer, she's drawing from about 600 years of history here. We've got Tudor, Elizabethan, Rococo, Regency, Victorian, late Victorian, Romanesque, some turn of the century, a little bit of 50s, 70s, and 80s. And it's really what I would call a fuster cluck. Um, it's not a swear word. It's a word my husband uses. At any rate, one blogger even mentioned that she's even kind of in, incorporated steampunk. And I've even noticed there's a little bit of medieval fantasy. It still feels a bit like Katniss, Everdeen, Arwen from Lord of the Rings sort of type of mashup. So this is an example of not the best execution of design, in my humble opinion. As Mark with Pollock got to season three and now season four, she's been able to develop more of a costume in uh, inventory, which has created more flexibility for the show. And I know that Michelle Clapton mentioned the same thing on Game of Thrones, that as she built up her stock, it was much easier to do the job. So this is why I think I've noticed a, a pretty good change in the show as it's gone along. So the only risk that happens here is, generally speaking, when you first start a show, especially the pilot, that sort of sets the tone for the show. So you're gonna have a little bit of a risk when you try to change the look of the show partway through. The next thing I wanna mention is that some of the construction, like in some of the custom made gowns, it's not always the best. And I mean, TV can, used to be at one point forgiving, but now with high def, it, it's not so forgiving anymore. And really like a lot of these shows are on people's big screens. So you can see every little thing. So a few examples of this where I'd like to see better is for instance, the patterns aren't matched up. That's just a really nice design detail and, and a sign of good quality in construction. Also, you, the use of modern fasteners is usually a really big giveaway uh, for the quality of a garment, like using zippers instead of like hooks and eyes and lacing as well. Um, when they machine hems or machine trims, it tends to lower the look of the quality. It tends to look more like medieval fair than medieval drama. And I mean, really, it comes down to issues with the budget, issues with the amount of time they have to execute the design. Um, that can be blamed for the reason why they're doing so many shortcuts. So incorporating these contemporary looks into a production is a very difficult um, thing because, I mean, I've worked as a stylist. I mean, you're working with someone else's artwork, essentially 
A stylist is not an artist. A stylist is more of a craftsperson. You're finding clothes that fit people. You're trying to match jewelry and accessories and shoes, hosiery, that type of thing, to work with the look. And you're, you're, you're attempting to blend them into with other characters. So it's it's not the easiest thing to do, especially when you're, you're working in a apparent historical situation. So I would argue that using an Alexander McQueen gown is probably going to not be the easiest thing to be doing because it's honestly it's just going to stick out like a sore thumb against a background of players who are all dressed up in renaissance costumes so that's a difficult thing and uh but at the same time i know the show was doing this because they're hoping that their viewers will be going hey i really want to own that gown or hey i want to really own those earrings so um that's one of the things that made sex in the city so tantalizing to many of its fans and I think that's one of the big draws for Rain for a lot of its young fans. Besides my sort of largely oh, general thoughts about the show and the design, um, I can obviously go into every little detail and, and so on about it because it's so enormous. I have just a few little things that I wanted to point out to you as viewers. Okay, so the one of the things I thought actually that were quite well done were the men's costumes. Some of them aren't period, obviously, but I thought they were quite good, and the young men looked really good in them. The only thing that I had a bit of an issue was, was Francis's armor from season one, uh, the episode Higher Ground. And you know, honestly, armor is like a really, really difficult thing. Like on Game of Thrones, all of the armor is custom made, like Michelle Clapton designs it. She's got several armorers, she's got several people making weapons and swords, and so on. Actually, the props people are doing that. And I've, you know, I've showcased it on some of my videos. So it's, it's really difficult to, to rent some armor and expect it to look decent. So I don't even know what the answer for this would be. Um, you know, in this case, like Francis and his group are not even wearing all the armor pieces. They've got like a cuirass, like they're wearing the, the chainmail shirt, and then he's wearing a cuirass over top of it, the pauldron, which is sort of the shoulder guards, and some of them have helmets, but they're missing all the rest of the pieces. So just to give you an example, I'm going to show you what... Uh, the real life Francis's actual armor look like. So this is what this is what actually this is what Francis's armor actually look like. Um, it's uh, it's circa like 1555 to 1560. It's got all the pieces there, and this is only partial. Like it doesn't even have the the leg parts. But you can see how elaborate it is. He, it's pretty small, obviously, because he was kind of a small guy. And so. It's almost impossible for them to have even attempted to achieve this look. So I'm not even sure what the answer was there, but that was just a bit of a pet peeve of mine. So I pretty much adore almost everything that Elizabeth I wears in the show. I just, you know, I think it's fantastic. Um, this is one, though, I'm not crazy about, and I'll explain why. So Rachel Scarton, who plays Elizabeth I, she's beautiful. Uh, she's actually naturally a, a blonde and not a redhead, and she's got quite fair skin. I just feel that uh, compared to most of her other costumes, this costume is really, really too pale for her. And this is just sort of a general guideline for, for redheads, that we don't look good. I'm a redhead. We don't look good in these very, very soft, uh, washed-out colors. It tends to make us look washed out. The other thing is, is the silhouette. So what's going on here is... Elizabeth I in real life actually was very small busted and had a very tiny waist like Rachel does. And she's also actually, Rachel's actually got a, quite a long torso. So I think what it's doing is sort of pancaking her. And also it's giving her a bit of a like cylindrical look, like almost a bit like a tube. So what I would have suggested is maybe they could have um, put in some, some bus cups would have helped a little bit and also maybe added some fuller gathers into the hips just to give a little bit more of a silhouette to the skirt. Sorry guys, if you love this costume, I'm just gonna apologize, but I really, uh, I just, I really am not a fan of this one. Um, <clears throat> it feels like a little bit Disney princess, like dress up style costume. And it just has a lot going on. So you've got the silver and the appliques and you've got this sort of the slash sleeves and the several tiers of the skirt. And it's just, it looks too costumey to me, um, which I know is a strange thing to say, but just costumey as in like costume ball or costume fair, uh, costume party. Uh, it would have been perfect for that. But for a TV show, it just doesn't, it looks wrong. And it just feels really out of step, I think, for a 16th century French court. 
season four, I just think what looked amazing. Like they really had brought the look together, finally found sort of like their voice, if that's possible thing to say for a look for the show. And I noticed that they kind of abandoned a lot of the more contemporary costumes, clothing from the designers. So I'm not sure where the decision went into that, but I, I'm really happy that they did choose to do that. And this is a really great example here, just this picture. But I'm gonna go over some of my very personally, my personal favorites, okay, that I adored. This Queen Mary gown uh, from season four, episode six, is one of my favorites for her. It's very regal in this blue, green, and gold brocade with the lovely gold embellishments on the collar and the cuffs. It's got a sack back gown feature, uh, otherwise known as a robe a la Francaise, which is sort of an 18th century French style of gown. So while it's uh, still a bit early here for that have to been had come into fashion, it still feels very anchored in the Renaissance period. I really like this sweet storybook style for Mary in the season three episode, The Hound and the Hare. What's really, really lovely about it, it's, it's got this cute embroidered detail in the center front bodice panel that's trimmed with beaded cartridge pleating. And I particularly love the gold lattice mesh sleeve inserts in the crisscross pattern. It really reminds me of Tudor windows, if you know what those are. They've got these sort of um, panels that have sort of inlay uh, cross hatches in them. And the only thing that I might suggest uh, is that because it's black, which feels kind of old for Mary, I know it's her signature color, I think it would have been much nicer had it been like say in a forest green or something of that color, maybe even a deep purple. I love this look for Mary. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a good picture of it. I found this one on Pinterest, but it's so great. I had to show it. Um, <clears throat> the bodice, it's really richly, a richly textured brocade and the sleeves are constructed from a really unique style of like fabric. I couldn't quite tell what it is. It almost looks like it's crushed or something. And it appears to have fur cuffs. It might be a muff, I'm not sure. So the neckline, it's actually what's called a uh, partlet collar, although in this case, it's a mock neck. It creates that sort of triangle opening there. And it's very Elizabethan looking with a lovely tapered waist, sort of rigid tapered waist, and the full gathers at the side. And I even love the cloak with it. It's just, you know, I love that it's not uh, matchy matchy. Here's another really awesome look for Mary. It's this purple and gold brocade gown that's been used, it was used in three episodes in season three, which is awesome because this thing, this gown is far, by far one of her finest. <clears throat> I love the, the lines that give it that Renaissance feel without actually being Renaissance. It's got this really nice contrasting black with gold printed silk yoke collar that looks again like a partlet, but it's actually part of the dress. And they've piped the princess seams, which is a nice little detail. And then it's got deep pleating in the skirt at the waist that create that bell silhouette, that sort of that farthingale shape. And my only complaint is it's a little bit tight across the bust or the chest, which I mean, sometimes um, from fitting to the final uh, wear, it, you know, things change. So that could be what it is. Here is a custom empire waist gown uh, that Mary wore in season three. And it's a little bit more contemporary than Renaissance, but not to the extent that I find it distracting. It's a beautiful pea green silk and gold lace fabric, which are both gorgeous. And what's, of course, the best feature of the whole thing are these beautiful appliques uh, on the bodice and cuffs that are made from a fabric, an embroidered and beaded illusion fabric from B&J Fabric in New York. I know if you're a fan of the show, you would have definitely seen this season four episode, Pulling Strings, where Mary gets married for the second time. She wears this custom gold lace dress and veil. The fabrics were supplied by Fabrilux and the gorgeous embellishments on the bodice were hand embroidered by Lori Lemelin of A Brash Embroidery and that's a Toronto based wearable art company. So this gown, it sort of stands in stark contrast to her former contemporary wedding gown which was actually purchased uh, off the rack from a wedding supplier. And that one, I mean, honestly, it was like something like out of the 1950s. It looked like it should have been worn by Jackie Onassis, Jack Kennedy, sorry. And the costumes in this episode really show how much the costume designer has grown 
through the seasons, through the four seasons. Here's a close-up detail of the beading by Abrash Embroidery. This is probably my favorite costume for the entire show. I just adore it. It's from the season four episode, sorry, it's from season four, episode six, and it's worn by the character Catherine de Dimici. Uh, the gown is made from a beautifully embroidered black silk fabric with a contrasting red silk underskirt. And I find that the neckline is especially flattering on Megan Fellows, who, if you don't know this, she's Canada's sweetheart. She's like Anna Green Gables, for gosh sakes. And she looks exquisite here. And I'm also glad that they forgo the necklace, forgot, forgone the necklace, um, because it just looks so beautiful and clean having it open like that and really letting the dress just be the main attraction. Here's a lovely Elizabethan costume worn by Queen Catherine in the season three episode, Safe Passage and Spiders in a Jar. The fabric supplied fabric is this gorgeous greeny gray and bronze brocade. It, the gown is cut typically Elizabethan with the fitted sleeves and false hanging sleeves. And they would have been attached with laces at the armhole of the bodice and the shoulder wings, which is an embellishment here, were added to hide the lacing and to give the shoulders additional width. Um, the only thing is I did prefer the underskirt, the underskirt worn in Safe Passage. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it compared to this one, which looks like it's, um, it's got uh, tucking, like pin tucking. And the other issue I had also is that the pattern isn't matched to the back that I did mention earlier. And as well, I said that that is sometimes a shortcut that's taken to save on time. Here's a jacket that we see in the season four episodes one and two, worn by Elizabeth I. And it's a custom embellished silk brocade coat made by Susan Dixon Company, a Toronto-based costume business. The fabric and appliques were sourced by Fabrilux. And I have to say, this costume is pretty much perfection. The fabric and trim choices are gorgeous, and the execution of the design is flawless. So, like seriously, compared to some of the stuff we've seen in earlier seasons, like it, there's no comparison. There's a lot of attention to detail. For instance, the pattern is matched up at the princess seams, like which is a really difficult thing to do. So that's something that the cutter would have done. And they've put piping uh, into the seams, which is a lovely design detail. detail. Here's another exquisite example for Elizabeth I. And fa sadly, I can't find another picture of it. I tried hard, seriously, I did. So this is the best I could come up with, but there's a good close-up of it, of the bodice and a little bit of the skirt. And it's made from a mauve brocade fabric and the appliques were both supplied by Faberlux. Again, you can see again, the construction is very well executed and the pattern again is matched nicely the collar is piped and the appliques are hand sewn and the bodice is closed at the center front with bars and tacks. Yay, no zippers. So unlike that soft green gown that we saw earlier, sort of that seafoam green gown, this is a much better color for Elizabeth. It's this gorgeous green embroidered silk shantung gown and it has a contrasting pea green underskirt. And it's a great color for redheads. So you shouldn't put redheads in pastels. They just don't work as well. Okay, so she's wearing a partlet at the neck, and that, if I didn't mention this earlier, it's a 16th century covering of the neck and shoulders. Uh, it's sometimes used to fill in a low neckline. And for upper class ladies, like royalty, it would be oftentimes made of lawn and attached to the undergarments before the gown was put on. She also has these little shoulder rolls at the shoulder seams, which was a decoration to create height. And Elizabeths are all very sweet and dainty and decorated, but oftentimes they would have been like really overstuffed and exaggerated uh, proportions. Here's another fantastic floral embroidered silk gown. Uh, I'm not sure which color is correct. Like the one on the left is sort of more um, more oranges and pea greens, whereas the one on the right looks more red. So uh, possibly the one on the right is outdoors and the one on the left is interior, so it's kind of hard to tell. One on the right is probably more accurate though. And a great, uh, again, a great silhouette. She's got the shoulder rolls again, nice fitted, tapered waist, uh, corseted bodice, uh, a little bit of gathers at the side and back that give the fullness. Really nice detail with the brace, uh, sorry, the belt, which just kind of gives that nice little detail at the front, almost like a cross. And I think it's just a really flattering silhouette to the actor. Elizabeth wears this really amazing sort of outfit in the season three episode, 
sorry, in season three, episode nine. And, you know, honestly, green is always a great color for redheads. Uh, the overrobe, I don't think is actually was built. It looks like it's vintage. It looks something like um, a 1950s coat by Spanish couturier Cristobal Balenci- Balenciaga, which I've actually provided you a sample. And he termed, he coined the term oversized sleeves, melon sleeves. So that's what these big puffy sleeves would have been called. But, you know, honestly, I don't mind that it's not period. I think it kind of works. She's sort of, the designer has sort of anchored it a bit with um, the belt and the jewelry, and it just comes together really, you know, really nicely. In season four, episode four, Elizabeth wears this sort of manly style jerkin. It's like a lady's jerkin, uh, which is a sleeveless vest of sorts. Uh, again, I can't I can't find any other photos of this. I, this is the only one I could come up with, but I really love it. It I love the way that they use the, the trim is for texture, create texture. And it looks so good in this outdoor setting. It's sort of a slightly sporty setting, so I think it works really, really well for her. This gown is so simple, but like seriously, it's just stunning. Um, it's simple, it's an off the shoulder style gold brocade. It's got sort of a slightly fitted upper sleeve, but then it sort of goes into these beautiful bell sleeves. You can see a little bit the, the outline of her corset underneath, which is giving her that really rigid sort of structure. And uh, also keeping those, those seams really nice and flat and in place. And this looks like something, seriously, I don't know what you guys think, but it looks like something Cersei Lannister could have worn in, in a couple of the earlier seasons of Game of Thrones. You can let me know what you think. This is such a fantastic gown. You might have seen it in some of the posters. Actually, the one on the right is from one of the posters, I think. Um, it's totally Elizabethan looking. It, I mean, they've used a contemporary fabric, but that's okay. It, it, looks, it looks stunning. Um, she's definitely got the silhouette down. Uh, the bodice is very rigid. The corset, the corset underneath is definitely emphasizing her décolletage, as you can see on the left. And it's got these really great full gathers, um, you know, that they've used instead of, say, cartridge pleating to create that width. And I love, of course, that beautiful soft F-crew lace ruff at the neck, which just adds a, a lovely little detail. So I, I didn't go over a lot of the modern things. And, and one of the reasons why I found this fantastic uh, Tumblr account by a girl named Fatima. She has this Tumblr account called Fashions of Rain. And on there, she does this complete breakdown of all of the, uh, by, she does it by season, she does it by character, and she does it by designer. So you can go there and look at every character's looks for the most part, as much as she's, she's been able to do. In some cases, she even tells you where to find them, uh, what online place that uh, the designer purchased them from, uh, and even jewelry and accessories. So she's done it for all four seasons. So I'm gonna leave a, a link in the description below for that so you can check her out. So anyways, guys, I'd love to hear your thoughts on these costumes. And you know, do you have a, do you have a favorite costume that you wanna tell me about? Do you have a costume that you hated? Um, maybe you didn't agree with my assessment. That's cool. You know, hey, it's just my opinion. But I hope in some way you might have learned something today that you can share with your friends. So I always welcome your comments. So if you want to, please leave one below in uh, the comment section. And please, as always, just keep in mind that it takes a great deal of time for me to put these videos together. So I really appreciate it if you would like and share my video. So thanks again so much for watching.